The second one here is going to be more about how these states have come to form here in the West. We're focused on the West, which is, really just means European, uh, particularly Western, Northern European uh, culture, as it spreads, you know, develops in Europe and spreads to the United States, Canada, later Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, etc. Um, we're going to focus on this, uh, even though there's, of course, other systems still going throughout the world, uh, because we're talking about specifically American government in this class. So uh, we're going to focus in, we're going to pick up uh, where the post-classical era begins in world history, where you would say here, I guess, through the Middle Ages or medieval era uh, is going to uh, begin. So this is going to start with kind of the fall of Rome here in Western Europe uh, in the uh, 400s um, AD or, or CE. And uh, we're going to start there because it's important you understand what our early modern and modern state systems came out of. Um, so when they make references to things in the um, uh, Constitution or the, the debates um, leading up to the Constitution, the reasons for breaking away uh, from Great Britain and making our own uh, government constitution, um, you have to kind of know where it came from. Uh, and to know how much uh, improved uh, our sets of governments are here in the West now compared to in the past and the other, other government systems of the past, uh, you kind of know a little bit about them uh, to be able to compare. Uh, and it makes it seem uh, a little more uh, realistic to, to look at our government now uh, as opposed to one a few hundred years ago. So uh, we'll start here, uh, picking up again after the uh, fall of Rome, uh, in the West anyway, uh, when it is going to be essentially dissolved uh, due to various invasions, mostly from uh, Germanic, Germanic tribes and other barbarians that are going to cause this western half to collapse. The eastern uh, part will continue for another thousand years, uh, more or less. The last couple hundred years are pretty tiny. Uh, it will continue, but in the west here, and largely in the east, it's gonna be pretty much wide open, what you call a power vacuum, so there's no more central authority here. So, uh, the system that's gonna emerge out of this is gonna be what's called feudalism, and we'll get to that in a second. So you have the fall of Rome in the uh, fall of western Rome. In the fifth century, CE, and that's when you're going to have the collapse of what was uh, an organized, roughly centralized uh, set of protections for people. So they had their governments, they had their somewhat stability in prior centuries. Uh, they had protection from the Roman uh, army, they had, you know, Roman uh, judges and, uh, and governors and provinces and uh, local garrisons to maintain a general sense of support and security from others, uh, but once Rome's gone, that's going to evaporate. So, pretty much all the territory from this area here, roughly speaking anyway, uh, this area, not the entirety of it, uh, but a lot of it is going to... Uh, Collapse. So this is what it essentially was, uh, and in the 400s, that's going to uh, come to an end. So that area, all of a sudden, is sort of up for grabs. There's kind of a reason why uh, it's up for grabs, because, and this is actually important, I'm not just randomly talking about historical stuff, because it's American government class. Uh, the reason why, first of all, it collapsed, and the reason why they're going to be um, sort of on their own, is because you have a whole bunch of new people flooding in. Uh, this is kind of seen as the European uh, migration period, from roughly the, the 400 CE to about the... Mm, maybe eight, nine hundred CE. You could you could argue even a little further, but certainly by that point uh, they've about settled. But there's a lot of changes uh, environmentally. The world the world's a little warmer, uh, so uh, people are um, able to uh, cultivate more crops, grow more food, foods. They have uh, a little bit of population growth, so they kind of uh, need to find new areas to live. Uh, but we also have a lot of displaced peoples coming in from uh, the, the central plains of Asia that help lead to this. So. Um, in from the east, we have uh, groups coming in, like the Goths uh, are going to come in here from what is now about southern slash eastern Europe. Uh, they're going to be kind of moved out of the way uh, by another. So you got the uh, Goths coming in here and settling all over inside Europe uh, in, in these areas. Uh, so the Goths, uh, they're going to get around here in North Africa as well. Um, they're going to be being chased out somewhat by the, uh, a group from uh, Central Asia, uh, known as the Huns, if you've heard of them. The Huns are gonna come in here. Uh, you also have a group um, that's in Southern Eastern Europe uh, called the Slavs. They'll, they'll, they'll nestle in here as well, but the Huns come in. Uh, they invade all the way up to what is now modern day France uh, and uh, Italy, and they're gonna end up settling here in uh, uh, Central Europe or so. Uh, but you also have, from the North here, uh, the migration of uh, Germanic tribes, uh, so the Germans. So they're coming in, 
uh, and they're going to drive out the certainly the Western Roman Empire, uh, as well as the uh, indigenous people here. Uh, well, I guess they were technically indigenous, but the people that were there currently, uh, the, the Celts, are being uh, driven out uh, to the sides here as well. So you have a whole bunch of people moving around, and that's going to be responsible, if you care at all, about geography uh, or demographics. That's largely what's going to form what is now Europe. Uh, so you're going to have mainly German peoples uh, in these regions here. You're going to have uh, Gothic peoples kind of scattered throughout. Uh, and you're going to have uh, the Huns over here. Uh, and you get some other people called the uh, Balts are going to kind of settle in over here. Uh, and then the Slavs make their way in as well around that time and are already there to some extent uh, in these areas and the Bulgars too. So you have a lot of different ethnic groups coming in uh, and so they haven't been there before. These are new kingdoms that need to sort of form. And again, Rome is now gone, so we don't have that central protection or authority. Uh, so we kind of have to start over almost. So what's going to happen here is these new groups are going to have to form uh, new kingdoms and identities to, well, for several reasons. Number one, to organize themselves, uh, as well as protect themselves from each other and these other European uh, and Asian peoples that are, that are moving and coming in and migrating. Uh, so there's all of those reasons why they need to, uh, of course, form a new state system. So you have a uh, migration period, period, uh, of uh, Celts, of course, who are being pushed uh, to the peripheries, uh, the Germanic peoples, and you've got um, the Goths coming in and out, and you've got the Huns, the Bulgars, Slavs, uh, and others. So it's a, it's a mass influx of people. Brand new uh, cultures and civilizations. Yes, some of them will come, come into contact with Eastern Rome and did come into contact with Western Rome, uh, but they're going to be uh, largely new areas, uh, integrating with people that were already there or pushing them out. Nonetheless, they've got to sort of reorganize uh, this map. So you got uh, some major groups here. We'll talk about the Francs, which of course you probably know now is France. Um, you get quite a few uh, types of Goths here in Spain, uh, but there's also a good chunk of Celtic people as well. Um, you've got uh, the Bretons up here. They're actually Celtic. We'll talk about them in a second. Uh, you've got more other German tribes, lots of different ones. Germanic Huns sort of settle in here. Uh, Germans kind of inhabit these regions. All the Francs are technically German but they do merge in with the Italians. Um, they get here, the Slavs kind of s settle into these areas. Slavs, that's by the way where the word slave is derived from. The uh, uh, Europeans used to raid Eastern Europe and take these slaves and sell them to other Europeans and to the Arabs uh, in North Africa. Uh, but anyways, we'll get to that and the, the, the Balts over here and the Bulgars. All right, and you've also got the Greeks that are over here and, and all that. So um, we don't care too much about this map in particular. I do kind of want to finish it though, hold on. The Picts and Scots and the, uh, the, the other Celts that are now going to be Ireland. Anyways, so you've got these uh, groups that are all there and they need to form these new states, uh, of course, to, to protect themselves. So one of the things that they start developing in the six and seven hundreds, uh, particularly in the uh, uh, Frankish and Germanic regions uh, is what we call feudalism is going to develop, uh, and it's uh, it's going to start really early on, and, and I'll explain it here in a second. But the way that we know it and that I'm going to explain isn't going to be really popularized formally to like the 800s or 900s uh, CE. So feudalism, so it's got its origins earlier, uh, but the one we're going to talk about is, a, is like a sort of official uh, codified. No, I don't want to say official, but uh, the way the practice developed throughout most of the Middle Ages, all the way to the 13 and 1400s, when it started to, to cycle out. So feudalism, uh, so we'll say roughly the 800s, again, origins are earlier than that, uh, to 1400s, and it does continue beyond that, but that's when the, um, the, the, the trend starts going the other way, uh, or at least starts moving away from feudalism. All right, so you got feudalism. So here's how feudalism is going to actually work. Feudalism is actually a system that uh, it's basically a bunch of little kingdoms uh, that are organizing and, and coming together to sort of form this uh, protective layer or community against um, any sort of uh, uh, wrongdoers in their area uh, or any neighbors that might be um, threats to them. So feudalism, so it's gonna be derived from uh, uh, localized kingdoms, small, Kingdoms, initially anyway, uh, headed by a monarch 
Uh, generally, it's a king. Of course, it can be a queen, and it is at some time points in history. Uh, but that's the person that's going to head it. Uh, and again, they, they do generally tend to small, start out small. Uh, but these monarchs, kings or queens, um, are sort of the ones that are in charge, that have the wealth, etc. And they are going to set up a system of, of vassalage and fealty where they basically have people below them. There's a hierarchy. They have people below them that are, of course, the further they, down they go, the less power and freedom they have. Um, where they have their own duties and they swear oaths, basically to form this, uh, this hierarchy of dependence where uh, at the top you can mobilize resources, which again is one of the purposes of the state, mobilize resources uh, to protect uh, the peoples, and generally do have that monopoly on violence too, where they're supposed to be anyway, the only ones that are issuing executions and, and, and killings uh, for, for punishments. All right, so these localized small kingdoms, so we've got kind of a hierarchy developing here. So uh, I'll first get the, nah, I'll, I'll define the terms first. So below the monarch are what you call vassals, uh, and vassals are those that uh, swear uh, allegiance and aid to uh, the monarch, or the ones directly below the monarchs that, uh, that, that operate in the, what are more so the common realms, uh, to monarch or the uh, lords. And those are the guys that are directly below uh, the monarch. So that's what a vassal is. So they basically agree uh, to this, this loyalty, this military service, uh, and other services for the king uh, in exchange for um, rewards. Uh, and that's gonna continue to go downward all the way to the bottom to protect everybody in that hierarchy. So um, these, uh, what we're gonna call lords here, the people that are directly below the monarch, uh, they're gonna um, swear an oath of what's called fealty, uh, which is derived from the word actually fee, like to pay. Uh, it's basically an oath of loyalty Uh, in the form of uh, reward, but also they're going to be uh, uh, making some sort of payment back uh, of, or, or some sort of uh, bonded service, whether it's military service or actual payment uh, in the form of taxation or rent, uh, because the monarch's going to be one that's going to largely own the land. And the reason why I picked this uh, year 800, and most people do, is because there's a dude uh, from the Frankish kingdoms that's sort of establishes how you're supposed to reward these people directly below you that are supposed to be loyal to you. Uh, so that there's invaders or some sort of turmoil, they listen to them and send them military aid and, and, and they deal with the problem. Uh, so, the hierarchy looks like this. At the top, you've got, of course, uh, the monarch, king or queen, whatever. So here we go, here's the monarch. I'm gonna say king just because it fits more easily in a pyramid. All right, so I got the king at the top. I can't even make a damn triangle. Well, this triangle's got a little, little flat portion at the top, but oh well, we'll live. Okay, kings at the top. Uh, below, of course, uh, the, the further down you go, the, these are vassals. So the first vassal layer up to the king uh, are gonna be the, uh, what are called lords. Uh, and those are gonna be, uh, depends on the title, dukes are generally uh, higher up than barons, but there's all kinds of titles like earls and, uh, uh, and, and viceroys and things like that. So uh, that's where the lords are. And these are what are referred to as the nobility, the nobility, or uh, the aristocracy. Aristocracy. Uh, that generally means that uh, there's a, a hereditary lineage. So once you are granted lordship and you swear your oath of fealty to the king, uh, your possessions generally get passed down to your heirs, usually male heirs, but depending on the area, can also go to female heirs. But it's generally the firstborn son uh, and, and on down. But of course, we do have uh, females inheriting territory at various points as well. So I'll make this smaller because it looks weird being that large. Okay, that already looks weird because we're missing the top piece. Well, actually, we'll say God, the top piece is supposed to be God. There we go. Or an emperor, could, which would be the king of kings, but that's what's supposed to be technically. All right, so those are the lords, and um, these are the ones that, of course, are uh, vassals to the king. And what they're going to do is the king's going to reward them, provide them with something, but they have to offer uh, a, 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 a service in return. So generally, and this is what's going to start here in the 800s, mostly, thanks to a Frankish king who conquered, at least temporarily, uh, a large chunk of territory. In fact, they were, they were referring to him as like the, uh, uh, the renewal of the Roman Empire. His name was Charlemagne, uh, and his empire was referred to, I should extend a bit this one more, 
Uh, his empire was referred to as the Carolingian Empire and later the Holy Roman Empire, but we don't care about that for this class. We do care about Charlemagne, though, because he started the trend of, as a king, offering service to people in, in order to, to assure their loyalty uh, in land. So that's kind of the reward. And land back in the Middle Ages, uh, even the early modern era, like that was, that was wealth. You got your wealth from that. If, if you could produce agriculture, that was pretty much the only way to get money. In fact, that was often the way you would exchange money. So you could, of course, get silver, gold coin, etc. Uh, but like for the most part, the the base level of of of, of wealth and economic uh, exchange was actually uh, agriculture. So you got those lords, and uh, <clears throat> again, there's various levels of lords. But when you get to the non nobles, you get down to the knights. Oops, I skipped a part. Before I keep going, uh, the reward is generally going to be for the lords and the knights too. Reward since the 800s, since Charlemagne. Which again, you don't really need to know him necessarily. He's a French king that kind of started this trend in 800. Um, since Charlemagne, he is going to uh, uh, reward since Charlemagne in the form of land. Uh, that's the, the, the grant of land that is given to the lord that they get to uh, operate in is uh, referred to as a fief or a fiefdom. Technically, a fief could be any form of payment, but uh, fiefdom or fiefs generally refer to land specifically. Uh, so I should put fiefs. Uh, that was generally the reward you would get. So the king would conquer these lands with his, with his army and his other lords. Uh, and if uh, for, for your service and your loyalty, he'd basically give you a chunk of land, which you were then the lord over, only answerable uh, to him, the king in this case, and I guess God uh, for Christians. So uh, that was uh, an immense amount of power. So what did you have to do in return? Uh, you would have to depending on the arrangement. Uh, usually, military obligations were part of it. So the king, if they needed you, if they needed to invade somebody or defend uh, against enemies or a rebellion or whatever, they would require military service from you. So you would have to get all of your followers in your area, uh, people below in the hierarchy, essentially, whether it's lower nobles or knights or, or regular people, uh, and you have to muster up your forces and, and go help the king. Obviously, you could choose not to, uh, which was a problem. Um, and, generally speaking, depending on the people and the time, uh, maybe your, your army and your military uh, uh, contributions weren't well equipped or professional, uh, which were other problems. Uh, but generally speaking, that was what you were re re required to do. Uh, and that was the, the trade-off here. So they would get that, and then in, in exchange, they would have to either um, offer military service, military service, uh, and uh, sometimes they had to, uh, and usually they have to, uh, provide some sort of payment, uh, payment uh, in taxes. Generally, monarchs would try to raise money, obviously, to, to pay for, for expansive campaigns and building infrastructure projects and things like that, um, depending on, or, or, or castles, depending on the particular time and instance. But that's generally what you were uh, trading it off for. Uh, same thing applied to knights, except uh, the knights were generally, uh, they could, of course, be uh, chosen and delegated by the king, but they had a similar arrangement with the lords. Uh, the knights were generally the uh, soldiers. So what was weird about this in the Middle Ages here uh, was you, as a soldier, like n nowadays you think the army, you go to the army and they give you your equipment and training, but like knights were like their own training and they had their own equipment. Uh, so generally you had to have some sort of connection, whether it was your family uh, from generations before uh, or you were wealthy for some other reason. So you could actually afford um, armor and a horse, that was another part of being a knight, was a, was a mounted warrior with armor. Uh, and you have to train yourself and, and fight uh, and learn yourself, essentially, uh, how to fight. So that would mean that you do have a, this group of trained warriors that would uh, operate and work for lords and kings. And they could be also granted uh, uh, fiefs and, and other forms of, uh, of compensation. So it didn't have to be land. It could be also um, uh, state offices or some other sort of title or, or income or maybe a position in a city government or a guild or something like that. Um, uh, they'd be paid in that form, and then, of course, would, uh, would when called for, uh, as, as per their oath of fealty, they would go perform military service. Uh, or sometimes they could buy out of it, but nonetheless, they had to do something to, uh, to merit their title and the, the land or whatever position they were given. Uh, and as we further go, go further down, uh, we get less away from the uh, more warlike requirements. Uh, we get down to sort of what you might think of as like the middle class. Uh, this is where the merchants... 
uh, or the what are called landed gentry. These are non-nobles, so they're not knights, they're not nobles, and they just happened to acquire money through trade or banking or, or, or some other form, and they just bought land on their own and, and they own it. Um, so they don't have any rights or anything like that, but uh, uh, they, can, they can operate and are generally considered above the lowest uh, uh, section of people, uh, the peasantry, uh, which could include serfs. Uh, these guys had essentially nothing. They ha uh, were generally controlled by uh, the land-owning classes, specifically the lords, uh, kings, obviously, potentially knights, and not so often, uh, and not nearly as common was being owned by the emergent or gentry class, but certainly these top rungs, the king, the lords, and possibly knights, uh, the land they got as a, as a reward, uh, as a fee, they would, uh, of course, get all the people on that. So you were considered part of the property uh, back in the Middle Ages. You weren't necessarily like an individual with rights like we think of now. Um, so uh, that they were essentially slaves, and their what the boys were for. Their arrangements varied. Uh, they could operate in a town, right, working as an artisan, like a baker or a blacksmith or something like that, uh, or a ship hand. Uh, but they could also be agricultural peasants. That's what the majority of them were uh, back then. But uh, you had no, generally speaking, you had no freedom of movement or choice. Um, your jobs and professions had to be approved by others, uh, whether it was uh, lords in the area or, or knights or other people that were put in these positions of government that would dictate what jobs you could have and what you could make and all those sorts of things. Um, and generally, you didn't have freedom of movement either. So if you were acquired uh, through some sort of uh, vassalage uh, thief grant, uh, you were again just part of the property. You may as well bend the trees and bushes on, on the property too because you technically can't move and you're technically the property of the uh, people that own you. Um, and like as is the case with these upper classes here, uh, both of these classes also have to pay uh, homage to their, um, or payment uh, to the classes above them. So actually the search is going to skip up here to the knights and, and lords and not really pay merchants directly. Um, but they're uh, generally going to have to pay in the form of, again, military service if they're summoned. Um, but they're certainly going to have to pay for it, uh, whether it's through uh, offering grain, like food agriculture, which is the common one. Uh, they could offer other goods, too, if they're like an artisan and they, they made like blacksmithing stuff or woodworking stuff, whatever it is. They could offer goods as payment to the lords uh, or knights or king that way. Uh, and rarely, but possible, you'd get coin payments, too. Most peasants did not have any money. They didn't have the capacity to make that. Uh, uh, but sometimes the um, uh, merchants or gentry class could, could pay. So these are the uh, common folk. Technically the knights are common folk, but we'll say uh, uh, urban gentry classes. Again, those are like merchants, bankers, and, uh, people who own property, uh, and uh, peasantry. And they have to pay. They, have, they, of course, come with the property in most cases, and they have to pay uh, rent. Uh, and there's a few ways they can do it. One's called corvée labor. It's a French word. It means unfree, unpaid labor. So it's, it's another word for a semi-form of slavery where you're required to work at least or contribute a certain amount of your work uh, to the state. In this case, of course, the Lord or King. Uh, and you're not paid for it. You're just sort of allowed to live there for it. So that was possible. Uh, or they could pay in kin, which is just goods, essentially. I'm going to also write that goods. Uh, or coin, but that was rare. Could, could do it, though. Um, so, any sort of um, need for military service, you would just call on down the hierarchy. They would respond by military service or payment, whatever it might be, um, and you'd have that arrangement going. And it did work um, on a small scale, at least for what they needed uh, at the time being. And um, it, it, it's going to last for obviously quite a few hundred years, but it's going to change as time goes on. And let me, let me just show you that. Basically, I'll kind of preview it for you. In fact, I'll show you a, a really quick demonstration. What happens is these, these kingdoms all smart, start out really small for the most part, but what's gonna happen is um, as they, they war and feud and migrate with other kingdoms, um, kings conquer other kings, and then of course all of their vassals become vassals of the new kings. So what happens uh, uh, starting in the 900s mostly in England and France, um, and a place called the Holy Roman Empire, but we don't care about that, we're not gonna talk about that this class. Um, they're gonna start absorbing smaller fiefs and kingdoms around them, and they're going to grow into, uh, start to develop these kind of like national identities of what you, again, the beginnings of what you know now is like England or France or eventually Spain. Uh, by the 1400s, that's going to be um, consolidated as they sort of get rid of this feudal system slowly. So that's what we got going on. Uh, what am I forgetting about this? Um, 
Uh, before I show you the demonstration of kind of how this happened in England briefly, um, let me continue talking about this. Um, peasants, I forgot to mention the serfs. Serfs are much more common here in Eastern and Southern Europe, uh, and they are, they're just slaves for the most part. Uh, and even peasants, well, like I said, you couldn't really leave the land, you didn't have freedom of movement, and you, had to, you were forced to pay rent, whether it was labor or, or goods or coin. Oops, put that in front of um, but you could also be punished by the Lord for not listening to them or not producing enough or whatever it might be. Uh, and serfs in particular had absolutely no freedoms, uh, usually, or generally speaking. In fact, in the, uh, uh, in the East, they had private and public um, uh, serfs that had uh, zero rights, whether house servants or agricultural servants or whatever they were. Uh, so you did not want to be here. And this, again, was the majority of people. And what I forgot to mention, this is basically, it's not quite, but it's basically a caste system. Uh, so it's not just like a social uh, structure or hierarchy, like you think of now, like, oh, there's, you know, uh, uh, low income and, and lower middle class, upper middle class and rich. Uh, you can move between those here. It's hard to do, obviously, to just go out and make a bunch of money if you don't have any. And, and, and most people that have money don't lose it that fast, although the, some of them definitely can. But you can move. Like, you're not limited. If you're born poor, you could end up rich or, or, or vice versa. Uh, and... Well, they're not super super common statistically, like you know by percentage, uh, they are they're they're common enough so that millions of people end up doing that, uh, moving up and down. Uh, that's not really possible though in the feudal system. You're pretty much stuck where you are at birth. Uh, nobles can only be granted, um, and even knights can only be granted these fiefs uh, by the king, so it's relatively rare. Uh, and then uh, those those of course are pa passed on uh, through lineage, uh, or, or 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 yeah through lineage hereditary uh, passage. Uh, on down through time. The king could, of course, revoke those depending on the scenario, uh, but that was kind of it. And uh, if you happen to be some of these uh, lucky folk who somehow were able to make money as a banker, merchant, whatever, or, and then buy and maintain your own land, great for you. Uh, very rare. Most people are going to be peasants born with nothing, die with nothing uh, as property of their knights, lords, or king, or whoever it might be. Uh, so it's going to be what we call a, a, a rigid uh, or fixed social hierarchy, fixed. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of, lot of mobility, um, so no mobility. Low to no mobility. And again, it ain't easy now, but at least it's possible. Back then it was pretty much not possible unless they handed you something. Okay, so that's kind of how it looked. Um, and if, you, if you're wondering how these peasants survived, by the way, there were a couple ways they could do it. Obviously, they uh, uh, are able to subsist off of the land that they, that they live on. So uh, they are considered property but they, they can actually use that land to live off of, and then they, of course, pay their rent uh, in labor or coin or goods. Uh, and that's referred to, by the way, generally, it's in, especially in England, it's gonna be protected by a, a concept known as common law. So this generally means that, okay, the king or the lords might own the land, and you might be a part of the property on it, but you can use it to live off of. So whether they own forests or whatever, you can you allow your animals to, uh, to graze on them, use their rivers, uh, hunt in their forests, generally speaking. Um, you could uh, collect uh, fodder for, uh, or lumber for, for, for you know, building something or, uh, or, or burning something to, to stay alive, essentially. It doesn't mean you can go clear the forest uh, or you can um, hunt all the time. And sometimes hunting wasn't even allowed because it was the king's forest and they got to hunt or the nobles or whatever it was. But generally speaking, uh, common land meant that uh, it was available for uh, semi-available uh, by king uh, or lords for use by the public, which really meant just peasants, for uh, grazing for their cattle, uh, lumber and other things uh, for, for, for burning if they needed to. Uh, what else did I say? Hunting potentially. Uh, gathering, um, fishing potentially. So those are all limited uses. Uh, usually you can't just go farm it, um, but unless that's part of your designated job in that area. Uh, but that is uh, essentially what common land is going to be. So these peasants could use things legally in their own territories uh, that are held by the, the, the kings and the lords for the most part. There's going to be some variance um, depending on the kingdom and time, but for the most part that's generally true um, in, in this feudal system. And they get pretty mad, by the way, if, if they don't get this right. Um, tendencies uh, for revolts and rebellions come usually from the lords, because uh, the king's not upholding his end of the bargain, he's, he's collecting too many taxes or doing too many things they don't like. Or the peasants get angry because they're being overtaxed uh, for their rent 
uh, or they're being denied certain privileges they're used to having or need to have, uh, and they act up. Or, uh, God forbid, you uh, do some sort of religious um, uh, legislative practice that, that changes things, and then they all get angry at you for that. Um, so that's going to be kind of the reasons for uh, revolt. But uh, you're also going to have two, and don't forget this going forward, especially if you have an economics class. Uh, you do have a slow, slow, slow process of what's called enclosure uh, or privately owned land. For the most part, what I've talked about, all this land is uh, owned by the king. So yeah, you are uh, granted a fief and you're, you're, you're like a tenant there, lord, but it's not technically yours. Uh, in fact, oftentimes when you pass it on to an heir, you have to pay like a, like a fee to the king uh, on top of your regular taxes uh, for that passing on of the land as a, as a right. But it, it technically it's owned by the king. Um, so even though you're renting it from him, whether you're a lord, knight, whatever, uh, it's owned by him. Enclosure, though, are those rare occurrences that are slowly starting, particularly in England here, when this middle class, or sorry, these merchants and, and gentry are acquiring wealth, however they do it, uh, and they actually buy it, and so they own it. They buy it from the king, or uh, if the king is granted it to a lord, uh, they buy it from the lord, however they get it. They buy it, and it's just theirs. It's no longer the king's or the lord's uh, or, or whatever. Uh, and that's going to be a very, very slow process. So I don't say like, I don't mean like everyone's just going out and buying stuff in the uh, 1100s and 1200s and 1300s. Um, I think it actually starts in the 1200s. Slow development in 12th century. Uh, and that's going to continue into the 17th century. Uh, and, and of course, picking up pace as it goes, actually, say 18th century. Um, so it's really, really small amounts, and very, very few people can do it, but uh, this process does start, particularly in England, uh, in the uh, 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 1200s. I put 12th century, and then the 13th century. There we go. Oh, actually, no, it did start in the 12th. Never mind. JK. Uh, it's really small scale, though, and it picks up in the uh, 16th and 17th century a lot, to the point that so many uh, peasants are kicked off of the land they can use, they, they start rebelling because too much of the land is like literally, that's what enclosed means by literally fenced off, they can't, they can't use it uh, as peasants. So that's, that's essentially what the system looks like, and uh, I'll show you how it kind of evolves here over time. You can kind of see the problems too, by the way, because there's not a whole lot of uh, choice uh, or freedom in there. You're, you're sort of bound to the land you're born on and the class you're born in. You're subject to the king or the lords, and you are going to have disagreements between the kings and the lords and, and conflicts over that. But for the most part, you don't have control of your own life. You don't control your own property, generally speaking, uh, and you usually have a, a religion forced on you as well. I'll get to that in a second, though. So let me zoom in real quickly on England here for a second. So England doesn't look exactly like this. Sorry, all you British folk. I'm not doing justice for your uh, island. Oh well. So England kind of started out more or less like this. Um, when the Romans had control, they kind of like built this wall called Hadrian's Wall. Up here you had a, a few Celtic tribes, and others called the Picts and the Scots, or the Scotty. Uh, and then you had uh, Hibernia, which is now Ireland. These are all Celtic people. Uh, these are Celtic people too. So the Romans invaded, um, and gradually, they, I think in 43 AD they did this, and uh, they gradually sort of uh, fixed and formed uh, Britannia, uh, which is really just a bunch of uh, Roman cultured Romano uh, Britons. These are Celtic peoples. However, when Rome collapsed, uh, or began to collapse, in about 410 AD, they, they were like, yeah, uh, we're having some troubles in Rome, so you guys are on your own, we're not gonna help you out. Um, and so they were on their own for quite a while. And what happened as the Roman Empire fell, and all these Germanic tribes, like the Franks and, and whatnot, started coming in. You had a few coming from this region, uh, known as the Angles, that's the Germanic tribe, and the Saxons, and the, and the Utes and others, but we're just talking about Angles and Saxons. They start settling up here in, um, in Britain. And uh, they're not really able to stop them because there's so many, and they're not having these, uh, you know, the support um, from Rome anymore. So, as these uh, kingdoms start coming in, they start forming their own little uh, uh, Germanic kingdoms. Uh, and these, uh, uh, these Celts that are still here uh, form their uh, own kingdoms that some of them already exist, by the way. Uh, and over time, as these Germans keep coming in and forming their own kingdoms, uh, they start to control their various regions, having their own kings. Uh, you have, these aren't exact measures, obviously, but you had like uh, Northumbria, Umbria is one. You had also, what else? You have Mercia. I'm not gonna remember all of them, because it, well, who cares? Uh, Sussex, I think is what it's called. Wessex, real original names, West South. Essex, 
All right, they're in different spots. Uh, nonetheless, these are mostly kingdoms that are forming uh, that are feudal. So again, you got like, your king and your lords. Uh, but again, over time, what's going to happen is you know one um, kingdom is going to conquer another. They'll get into some sort of conflict over land or war. Uh, the king, of course, summons his lords and knights, and then the other king summons his lords and knights. They battle it out. One side loses one or several battles, and then they, they end up taking over, and that king is killed or removed. Uh, and, and, of course, those lords and knights and peasants that they owned before now are owned by the new uh, group. So over time, uh, these kingdoms start to expand and absorb one another. So you've got the more uh, uh, Celtic people over here and the more Germanic people over here. In uh, the 800s, you got some Vikings that show up from uh, Norway and Sweden and Denmark. Uh, they invade. They start their own little Viking kingdom, although it's not very little, um, in, in uh, the 800s uh, to the 1000s. Uh, you also have the Scottish people uh, remove the Picts, and they start uh, conquering their own areas. And uh, over time, so you got Vikings here. They battle and, and, and absorb each other. And uh, by about nine, the late 900s, the uh, peoples of, so these all been absorbed by Vikings, uh, the peoples of the Anglo-Saxons, what's remaining of them anyway, uh, is basically just like Wessex and Mercia and some others. Uh, these two kingdoms merge, and they are able to go in, I think his name was like Athenial or Ethanol or something like that. Uh, this king's able to go into uh, and KO the Viking kingdom, and KO the uh, Scottish kingdom that's threatening them. And then when they rebel again, they put down that rebellion. And then we have finally what you kind of look like as the modern state of England, roughly speaking, uh, as these all slowly become incorporated. And we kind of have what's England uh, by about nine, the 980s, I think. Maybe it was 960s. Whatever, we'll just say 900s to be safe. Uh, the kingdom of England uh, is, is formed of England. And that was a process that took, what, three, four hundred years to occur. Uh, and these feudal kingdoms would grow and fight for one another, and then the winning side would absorb the others. Or they wouldn't even fight, they would just like marry, intermarry. So like this king's daughter is married to this king's uh, son, and now he becomes the king of both kingdoms, and uh, they either unite through a, um, a marriage or a conquest. So you basically have these uh, small uh, fiefs and kingdoms uh, absorbed via marriage or conquest over time. So that happens in France by the 900s, and it also happens in England uh, by the 900s. And you're like, man, why are you talking about this, thing, this history? I swear I have a point, and I'm developing it. Uh, so we've kind of got the identities for what are going to be France and England. All right. Um, there is some more infighting with France and England in particular. Like, for example, the Vikings also made France and formed their own kingdom called Normandy, and then that kingdom uh, absorbs quite a bit of France itself. And they invade England and take over England in 1066, and then England's got a territory in England and in France. Uh, and then these two are going to duke it out for a, a long time. Uh, starting in the 1300s, uh, these two have a conflict between England that has some ch uh, territories here, uh, and here as well, obviously. Uh, and the French, they fight uh, a bunch of wars for 116 years, which they call the Hundred Years' War. Uh, and I mention this because this is where things begin to change. We start seeing that shift. Because remember up there I had feudalism uh, logged from 800 to about 1400. There's a reason why that's going to end. So the Hundred Years' War, which basically uh, takes place in the 1300s and 1400s, that's actually quite relevant. Um, it's gonna be back and forth. If you guys have heard of Joan of Arc, she's part of that one. Uh, this conflict, she like, you know, reinvigorates the French who are losing and they go and uh, she does get captured and killed and executed. Uh, but she does help drive the, the English out by re-inspiring the French uh, who are losing uh, for a good chunk of this fight. So the French do eventually win this and England's kicked out, sad face England. Um, but there's a few consequences for that. Um, the reason why the French ended up winning was because, and the English are gonna follow suit because they, they see how effective this is. Um, this is where you see the first application of uh, centralizing their government. If you remember, I mentioned that in the classical era, that like the Persians and Romans and, and, and Han Dynasty in China um, and other empires sort of uh, took all these local kingdoms and city-states 
and made them a part of their one single government. Like, it's basically like one king's conquering um, everything. And instead of like hoping that they listen to their, 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 their uh, payments for rent or their military service, you actually just directly control them. They're not really autonomous. They're, they're directly under your control and part of your government. Um, this is where a king in France named Charles VII, you don't even know his name by even saying that, uh, France begins to uh, centralize, centralizes kingdoms. And here again, we're, we're seeing the end of feudalism. So instead of having like all these little uh, fiefs with lords and knights on them and a bunch of peasants, and you kind of ask them for help and money every once in a while, and they, they do it a few times, and your country or your kingdom's losing, or they just you know get tired of paying this for this long war. I mean, it was over 100 years, these wars, and France was losing for a good chunk of it, and, and England too in the, the latter half. Uh, they just get tired of doing it, so they'll just stop paying. They'll rebel. They'll choose somebody else. They'll fight against you. You'll have a civil war. It's just a nightmare. So uh, France figured out that, you know, depending on these nobles who might get tired of helping me out or paying me or providing me with service uh, and getting a bunch of random peasants and knights who have uh, varying degrees of experience and armor, he's like, screw that. Let's get rid of it. Uh, we're going to have one centralized uh, government. So what he's going to do is he's going to uh, um, uh, reform uh, tax collection. So he has these official streams of money coming from these regions, uh, from these lords and, and, and officers that, and administrators that he places out there. Um, for, uh, reform tax collection and military service. This is where uh, a lot of the changes begin because this is where we start that centralization program and this is a big part of, of Western governments. They figure out that the fuel system sucks as far as being reliable and consistent and having high quality soldiers. So they centralize. They form a unified government that has a, a specific tax uh, policy. So the, the king's always getting a specific set of taxes. Uh, and they change their military service to not just like ask for help uh, and get a bunch of random peasants and knights that may have good equipment, may have good experience, maybe they don't. Um, they have a professional army that's permanently a part of that French uh, military. So. They provide them with a salary, so they're there all the time. They're then, of course, gonna be um, effective, more effective as they're experienced. They have uh, a string of commanders, not just a bunch of random uh, lords that may or may not cooperate with each other. They have like a distinct uh, military hierarchy. Uh, they're provided with weapons and gear, and it's gonna be a much, much, much better army. That's how they chase the English out so easily. And of course, the English are gonna have to copy this, this method as well once they see it happening. Uh, and they're able to uh, uh, stand up with this method against their enemies over here to the um, east and then later uh, to the west. Uh, and by the way, um, the uh, uh, kingdoms of Castile and Aragon in Spain are also going to use this strategy uh, to unify, centralize, and drive out their enemy, uh, the uh, Arabs that had conquered several hundred years ago uh, in Spain. So in the 1400s, we see France, uh, as well as Spain, and then later England, they're gonna start to centralize, and that changes the trend of getting rid of feudalism uh, and making it more centralized. So you still have that same social hierarchy, but the uh, king has a lot more control uh, of everyone. It's not just hoping that they um, um, fulfill their, their, their duties and requirements. You've got a, a specific system, and in fact now, if nobles decide to say, well, we don't wanna to listen to you, well, they're screwed because uh, you've got a good chunk of their soldiers permanently over there, loyal to you and trained, and they're not going to be able to rise up against you. So it protects the king's power. And you have that same hierarchy uh, in existence, but the power is centered around this king increasingly uh, rather than being spread amongst the nobles uh, and knights. So that's what's going on there. And this was good for a couple of reasons. Number one, this is more effective, obviously. So centralized government's more effective. Uh, more effective and professional. But also, this is when uh, Europe actually is able to stand up on its own because it's, it had been, a, been bullied by actual centralized empires uh, previously. Uh, so they're more effective, and then uh, Europe is going to be Europe not as easily, or even at all, well, not as easily bullied. They're still going to lose their fair share. But, uh, for example, you had in the 700s, um, um, into the to the, like the 900s or so, you had the Arabs break out and start their conquest. They got into Europe and, and pushed all the way back here into Spain, even into France uh, a little bit. And uh, the European uh, feudal uh, kingdoms couldn't really stand in the way. Um, you also had uh, the Turks come in from Central Asia uh, and push out the, uh, the, the, the Byzantines here who had a similar system. 
And um, when they decided to invade Europe, and they, all they had these little feudal kingdoms in the way, they just mowed them over for the most part. I'm making it sound easier than it was, but uh, they couldn't really stop them because these large centralized empires, whether they were the Ottoman Empire, which were Turks, uh, or the Arabs, or later when the Mongols show up on horseback, riding on in, actually they're riding this way first, riding on in, they just like totally manhandle and wreck um, all of the uh, people of Eastern Europe like a joke. Heavily outnumbered. Um, they've been also been fighting for months. Like they were just thousands of miles away from their homeland. They'd already been fighting multiple wars. They were like trying to uh, um, capture uh, an escaped Persian or something like that. Um, and the Mongols showed up over here in Eastern Europe and uh, they didn't trust them. So they tried to, to uh, fight the Mongols. They're like, no, no, we're just, we, we don't want to fight. We're just moving through. And the Mongols are like, okay. Uh, and they just totally wrecked um, the uh, Slavs of, of Eastern Europe and uh, with the Russians and the Ukrainians and the Poles uh, and the Bulgars and the Huns even. They just, they just smothered them uh, because they had a, a much more unified, unified centralized uh, state. So this is a big uh, move up for the actual Europeans and that's the, the next part of our stage here, uh, which you'll see. So 14 ends onward, we're gonna centralize, but uh, it's gonna be even more detailed than that actually. Uh, you're gonna see a okay, centralization process. So again, that's gonna be starting the 1400s till, mm, I don't know when you could say it ended. Yeah, I don't know if you could say it ended at any point in time, really. But certainly this is going to be going on to about the 1700s or so. Uh, you're going to have a centralizing, centralized uh, government and military under uh, the monarch. So that's going to happen. Uh, there's going to be a problem, though, because they're going to run into uh, the other major authority of the time, which is going to be uh, the Catholic Church. So I'm going to pause for a second on our, our state discussion because it involves religion and religion's involvement in the state. So you've got, um, throughout the Middle Ages, so we'll say the 500s uh, till, you could say about the 14 or 1500s, when they're... Uh, um, What's the word we're looking for? When their power and authority prestige uh, drop precipitously uh, or very, very quickly. Uh, you have a uh, um, church uh, and state union. And what I mean by that is coming out of Rome here, even though they're not an empire anymore, they do have the Catholic Church, which was made the official church of Rome um, in the uh, three and four hundreds in Rome. So uh, you have at the head here, in Rome, the uh, religious authority of the entire Christian world uh, at the time. So you have, starting the 400s, you have um, the Catholic Church was directly involved with, uh, with governments. And this was easier when they were feudal kingdoms because uh, they didn't really stand much of a chance against uh, uh, the church and all of its supporters, but as these states in the 1400s begin to centralize, uh, the church can't really do that much against it. So we'll, we'll talk about what they had exactly. So they had a lot of uh, uh, power here in these uh, uh, feudal kingdoms uh, and in the states. So they were actually a part of the government and operated with it. In fact, actually, technically, depending on the time and the situation, they were actually above uh, the government. So the Catholic Church has a very similar hierarchy to uh, the feudal uh, hierarchy. At the very top, which would be kind of like the emperor or a king, I say would be the pope. He's the one that makes uh, the uh, decisions. He's supposed to be literally like God or Jesus on earth, no God on earth. Uh, at the time, like the, uh, the one that communicates to God anyway uh, on earth to the people. He's the top. Uh, below him are, are kind of like what are lords, uh, the cardinals, which are part of his council. So these two make all of the decisions for what Catholic beliefs are and traditions and all that and change things or... Or, or, or keep them. Uh, then, of course, you got uh, local. Cardinals are like regional, and then more local, um, like lesser lords or, or knights, I guess you could say, would be the bishops. And then it goes on down to, to priests for individual churches, perhaps, and then laity, which is just regular people. Uh, this hierarchy, though, um, was always at odds with uh, the feudal hierarchy, which again, king, lords, knights, uh, gentry, peasants. Uh, they're always at odds with one another. So it, the question is like, who has the authority on a given matter? Uh, is it the Pope if they say something has to uh, uh, happen or not happen? 
or to listen to the king, uh, it became a, a contentious scenario because they were sort of merged. And the belief of this group was that, of course, they represent um, uh, God and religion, and they are, of course, above the kings of the earth. Uh, but then at times the kings might get frustrated with their policies uh, and try to, of course, uh, ins uh, assert their own will on them. But here's how the two were intertwined. So throughout Europe, in fact, like 30 or 40 percent of all the land in Europe, uh, you're going to have what are called beneficiaries, which basically means church land where a cardinal or a bishop uh, has uh, uh, some sort of a, of a cathedral or, or home or manor uh, on which they, of course, are going to be uh, in charge of the bishops, priests, and lady below them. So the church is going to be the largest, loan, largest uh, landowner, largest land owner in Europe uh, throughout most of it, all the way to the 15 to 1600s. Um, not only do they own the land, but you actually can't, at least if you did, you, you would get in trouble. Um, you might actually have to fight against uh, these groups or their supporters uh, uh, or uh, be excommunicated, which basically means the Pope says you can't go to heaven, uh, which is a big deal for the people in the Middle Ages. Um, you would have to, what was I saying? Large landowner? Oh, you had to uh, pay... So states had to pay taxes, had to generally pay taxes uh, directly to the Pope in Rome. So you had taxes to your king, you had taxes uh, by the king and the, and, and, and the lord, the peasants, you had to pay to the king, um, and then of course they also had to pay them directly to the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Now depending on the area you're in, uh, the king uh, or emperor in your region may or may not be abiding by this, but they were supposed to. For example, in England in most of this era, uh, not that era. Uh, in this era, they were generally doing that, and then when they stopped doing that, becomes a big issue. Um, so, generally speaking, they had to uh, uh, pay taxes. They had to. Um, uh, they owned land, and they were also these members of the church. They were generally immune to uh, what are called secular or non non clerical non church authorities. So, if they broke a law or did something that the that the land uh, the king or lord or whoever. Uh, said that they couldn't do or was you know, sort of a crime, they couldn't punish them for it. They'd have to go to a, a church um, uh, court, which were way easier on them. They would either just move them and not punish them at all, uh, or maybe they would actually get angry at the king or the lord for the law they had and so that they don't have to abide by it. Uh, or worse comes to worse, they would like basically demote them or remove them from the church, uh, which of course is, uh, depending on how you see it, far less severe than being tortured and killed or, or imprisoned, imprisoned for, for the laws. So uh, they were generally immune to secular authorities, or at least that was an issue if they weren't. Uh, what else did they have? Oh, and they often uh, operated uh, and enforced moral, uh, operated and enforced moral, moral, I guess say laws and policies on their own. Uh, so, you know, if, if, if any of these individuals uh, were guilty of heresy, like, you know, they basically said, don't believe the church, or, or, or the Christian God's not real, or the Bible actually says this, whatever it might be. Um, or they try to change some of the rituals that these guys have set by the book. Um, they can be declared heretics, uh, and then they would uh, potentially be excommunicated, which means they wouldn't get to heaven. And also, if you're a king or lord and you're excommunicated, the odds of the people below you are going to abandon you at that point, because you're no longer a Christian man of God, or you're sanctioned by the Pope, uh, you're generally going to be or at least under threat of losing your support and kingdom. Um, so, if they're declared heretics, you could be excommunicated. They generally, thinking that they were above uh, the secular uh, group, they generally, depending on the area and time, but certainly in England, at parts of in this, they had to, uh, they would approve uh, wars, uh, secessions, so like, you know, having a new king or marriage. They would approve wars, secessions, marriages, divorces, treaties, all sorts of political decisions, they would generally, if it's coming from a king, they would uh, either want or expect the approval of the pope, uh, and they could deny them uh, or not. And if the king refused, of course, the, the pope would excommunicate them and uh, threaten their spiritual life, or so they thought, uh, and their followers. And so it became a big deal. Uh, there were several occurrences where, um, you know, uh, kings went after the, the pope and, you know, Supporter kingdoms would help the Pope out and, and, and defend him, and sometimes they wouldn't, and they'd capture the Pope, and then they'd elect a new Pope, and it was, it was a big mess. Um, so that was kind of the ordeal you had, but uh, generally speaking, there was no freedom of religion whatsoever. It was 
your king may disagree with the pope, but you had to be Catholic uh, in this area, almost certainly. And if, you, and if you weren't, they would come down on you hard. Whether they found out or they found out, uh, if you were deemed a heretic, that was it for you. Uh, you'd be tortured and killed, um, um, generally speaking. Um, and they would, they would torture you to confess to being a heretic, and then they would, once you were uh, forgiven for that, they would burn you alive uh, as a heretic, but your soul was pure now. Uh, so it was just, it was, it was a lose-lose. Uh, and by the way, whether you're kings or lords, if you're convicted of a crime, there is no actual process for figuring out if you did it based on like evidence or witnesses or anything like that. They would just do like this random stuff that they consider divine tests, like the float test. If you float, you're, you're, you're innocent. If you sink, you're guilty. Or the, uh, they would like wound you or burn you. They'd like, they burn your hand or they burn you with an iron. Or they'd make you stick your hand into boiling water. Uh, and if you got, if your wound got infected and you died, then I guess you were guilty. But if you happen to live through this terrible experience, then I guess you were innocent. There were these terrible uh, methods of trying to do that. But um, that, that church union with the state was uh, a big issue, first of all. Uh, but it was um, generally a way to eliminate any freedom of, of choice you have in your religion. You couldn't even question it. Even questioning it or being rumored of questioning it uh, could get you the attention of the secular authorities or the clerical authorities. And they actually had a whole department for this um, uh, that was used later on called the Inquisition, which means to question. Uh, and that was generally approved by the secular authorities and sent by the church to go through and, and find any non-believers, whether they disagreed with Catholic ideas or they were Jewish or they were Muslim uh, or they were, um, uh, you know, some sort of Protestant, which, which were... Christians that broke away from the Catholic Church in the 1500s, um, they would go in looking for these, for these non-believers, these heretics, and weeding them out and killing them. So uh, even people that just disagreed with like, oh, I don't think that the uh, sun goes around the earth. I think the earth goes around the sun. That was a, a scientific idea that challenged the Bible, and so they would, they would come after you. And that was official policy too, by the way. Uh, states generally upheld, upheld that, and they would allow, or they would allow the, the church to uphold that. So uh, state and church were, um, and I mean state, you know, government, church, meaning religion, were infused to the point that there was no uh, freedom of choice, and in fact, you were heavily restricted on what your beliefs actually could be. Um, that's going to change, though, because, well, first of all, we have the Protestant Reformation, which is a whole bunch of Europeans that stopped agreeing with the Catholic Church and broke off, but that's what we're talking about. A lot of the times, it was the uh, series of disagreements between the, uh, the kings and the pope about you know, what they couldn't, could or couldn't do regarding a war or a marriage or a treaty or a law, whatever it would be. And the Pope would say no, but the king would say yes. The Pope would excommunicate the king. The king would say, screw you, and uh, invade them or disobey them or, or start their own church. Uh, that became why uh, it's going to sort of end here in the 13, but certainly by the 14 and 1500s. You have kings now, even if they are Catholic, they're going to generally do their own thing, whether or not the Pope says you can or can't. Uh, but... In this early phase, the five, six, seven hundreds, all the way up to the, the, the late part of the, the Middle Ages, uh, the, the church had a lot of authority uh, by controlling the king, what they could and couldn't do, uh, or approving it or not, and then excommunicating them. But that's going to start to fade, because as these states begin to centralize and become powerful enough, they can just ignore the pope, uh, because the pope has no authority um, and no ability to stop you if you want to go invade them and, and, and remove them for your own purposes. So... That is um, how the church is involved. Because I almost forgot to mention that before I went on here. And now we will talk about uh, how this centralization process is going to actually uh, continue and enhance itself and how England is going to be a bit different. And that's important because uh, we are essentially, uh, the, the systems that we're going to use here in the United States and establish are largely uh, inherited from this uh, sequence of events from the English. So... One of the first dudes to uh, disagree with the, the Pope um, and say, I want to get a divorce, and the Pope said no. Uh, he wanted to have um, a male heir, and his, his wife, who was Catholic, wasn't giving him a male heir. And so he's like, I want a divorce. The Pope's like, that's not a good enough reason. So then uh, this guy, Henry VIII of England, basically said, well, screw you. I'm just going to be... I'm just going to be the, uh, uh, the head of the church here uh, in England. So actually starting here in England in the uh, 1500s, England. Uh, we have a monarch, Henry VIII. Now, he didn't uh, necessarily want to start his own church, but he did want to say that, so we'll still be Catholic, but um, at least initially, uh, but the Pope doesn't call the shots here. I call the shots. 
Uh, and the main shot he wanted to call was, of course, uh, putting a bishop in place that would approve of his uh, um, divorce. Uh, so that's what he did. Um, Henry VIII, of course, is going to uh, reject the Pope and uh, declare himself himself the uh, head of the church in England. Again, not intending to like make a separate church per se, but he wanted to say, well, here in England, we don't care about what you say. We are going to be the ones that, I'm going to be the one specifically, him the monarch, I'm going to be the one that is uh, uh, deciding what the religious policies are. If there's a bishop or something that disagrees with me, I'm just going to remove him and put my own uh, guy in there that I want to. Uh, so he's going to uh, make some help the, the head of the church. So what he does is he there's a few things. He's going to uh, take all the church land, and they had, by the way, about a quarter of all the land in England at the time. So that was huge for him because he could take it and sell it off to people and made a ton of money. Uh, and also made sure that the people wouldn't want to go back because they got land for it uh, if, uh, if he wanted to uh, reverse uh, this later on. Uh, so takes church land. Uh, he no longer pays taxes to Rome. He, those taxes people were paying to Rome now just go to him. So he's going to get a lot more land and wealth because of this. Um, takes church land and taxes. Uh, and he's going to make the decisions, makes religious decisions in England and uh, picks the uh, bishops. So if they don't want to uh, annul his marriage, then great, he'll fire them and he'll put in somebody who will. And that's exactly what he does. Uh, and that's exactly what happens. That's a big deal in England. There, I mean, I'm oversimplifying this and there's going to be a lot of uh, people who oppose this, but he's essentially going to get his way um, by the time uh, his Catholic daughter takes over and tries to reverse it, but his Protestant daughter takes over Elizabeth I and uh, reestablishes and confirms and consolidates this. Uh, he's going to be the one that uh, kicks the uh, Pope out uh, and makes him the central monarch. So he's, he's already uh, centralized authority by basically ignoring what the nobles say and, and having his own standing army and doing what he wants. But he also now kicked the Pope out. So he's the head of the church and the state. Uh, so he's going to actually be the one that sort of creates this theory uh, uh, referred to as the divine right of kings. Uh, and this is going to be the thing that's going to really uh, kill the um, uh, feudal system, really curb stomp it. It's already started in the 1400s uh, with, with France and Spain and, and England to a lesser extent. Uh, but that was just referring to the government. Now we're talking about kings uh, totally ignoring or kicking out uh, the, the church authority that's been there for, for hundreds of years, um, taking land and taxes and, and dictating what kings and queens can and can't do. Uh, he's just going to toss that all out and basically write his own book, uh, essentially, uh, instead of rules. Uh, but he's going to start this policy known as the Divine Right of Kings. And again, I'm telling you this for a reason. Um, because the, the Americans would be very much opposed uh, to governments acting in this way. Um, and it's a big part of, of forming a national identity here in the U.S. Um, the Divine Right of Kings, uh, he's going to uh, declare himself... Um, they basically believe that he was God's representative on earth instead of, like, the Pope, for, for example. So he, he believed, basically, the people chose a king, people chose a king. Then metaphysically, like, his soul, basically, uh, the soul was uh, 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 given to, uh, to God. So people chose a king, and then, like, magically, metaphysically, this soul uh, is somehow given to God, and God is going to act through this, this human body. So the, the king is still a human, but it's like God acting his will out through the soul uh, and body of this king. So soul given to God. That's going to make, of course, the uh, king is now not just the king, but the king is the literal Godhead. Uh, and cannot be limited or disobeyed by anybody. Because not only is he the secular ruler, right, the ruler of the, the people on earth, but he's also... Uh, a connection to and, and ruler of, of, of the spiritual realm, at least here in England. Uh, so list, not listening to him is wrong on two accounts in that he's going to be uh, able to punish you on earth as well as potentially in heaven because you're either disobeying God or in the case of, of, of Henry VIII, he's actually the, the head of the church. He could excommunicate you uh, if you're an adherent of that. So that's going to be a big deal. Um, and that's going to uh, consolidate his power. Uh, and centralize it even further, so any, any locals that are going to be likely to oppose them are much less likely to now. Uh, and that becomes a very popular uh, view, especially in France and Spain um, and other places, and in England too, by the way. 
uh, as uh, they centralize more, they also s- sort of adopt this view as well, even if they're Catholic or, or, or Protestant, in that they uh, believe God is acting through them, uh, and therefore uh, you, you cannot disobey them. They can do whatever they want. They can ignore nobles if they want, uh, because, or these lords who are, who are pesky and, and bothersome, or peasants, because uh, they're not just the early, earthly kings, they're the, uh, the divine kings as well. So, um, lots of other Europeans are going to follow suit. Europeans... Uh, also adopt this, adopt this theory of uh, what we call absolutism. So divine right of kings is basically the spiritual element, but absolutism means they have absolute power. They don't have to answer to anybody else. It's the king, what the king says, and nobody else matters. It doesn't matter what the pope says, it doesn't matter what the nobles say, even if they're all mad, uh, you're disobeying, by disobeying them, you're disobeying God, not they being the king. Absolutism is a complete control, complete unequaled control of um, the uh, state by king or monarch. Uh, and that's going to be, of course, spreading to other places as well. It's going to stay there in England with a guy named James I. It's going to adopt this policy or try to. You also have guys like Louis XIV of, of, of France later on. These are both later on, obviously. Um, but that's going to be a, a popular trend. Uh, as these kings become more powerful, they're going to uh, do whatever they want. They're going to abuse whatever powers they want. So if you disagree with them, they might excommunicate you. They could certainly have you imprisoned or silenced uh, just because they don't like you, because they can do whatever they want. Uh, and they're going to abuse these powers. They'll pass whatever taxes they want. Uh, they'll build whatever palaces they want, no matter how expensive it is, how much it costs you. Uh, they, if they don't like you, if they suspect you of doing something, they can put massive fines on you to fund their programs or put you in prison, have you killed without a trial. Uh, They can control you from saying bad things about them. Uh, They can do whatever they want. And that's going to be a a major, major factor in um, when the Americans formed the U.S. Constitution. And even before that, uh, when they they declare independence and write the Articles of Confederation, they have a lot of these tendencies in mind because this becomes a very English attitude, at least towards uh, us here in the American colonies. Uh, They have this, this sort of attitude. And this is what... Um, the United States, when it's forming these British colonists, are, are trying to prevent uh, and avoid. Uh, we will talk, though, uh, more so in a bit about um, how uh, England, even though they do start this trend, they're also going to be the uh, main Western government that goes away from this trend. So it does start there, spreads on into France, uh, and later into Russia and Spain, all these other places. Uh, and England tries to maintain, at least the kings do, but England's going to also be the only one to go a different way. Uh, the way that really influenced um, our uh, set of beliefs here uh, in the United States. Uh, However, my time and voice are running out, so I'll pick that one up tomorrow. Uh, So if I'm wearing something different, that's why.